understand, not mine. Friends, speak to our hearts, be an encouragement to us this morning. In your name we pray, amen. So now if uh, you brought a snack with you, uh, now's the time to dig that out uh, with your Bible, obviously. Um, I say that because some of my family threatened that they were going to bring uh, hot cinnamon rolls to eat, and I was thankful that they parked far enough away that I couldn't see that. Um, but we are glad that you're here, and I know this is a little different for you, but this is going to be really different for me um, because I am looking at a whole pile of windshields, and I can kind of see a few faces. Um, I can't really tell if you fall asleep, so you're on your own with that. And, uh, but but I, I'm excited that we could be together and spend some time looking at the Word of God and talking together this morning. We're gonna, I'm going to start a series this morning that's going to happen for us over the next, really, year and a half. And we're going to start looking at uh, a sermon from every book of the Bible. So we're going to talk about the whole story. And every book of the Bible has something to tell us uh, either about who Jesus Christ is or about the character of God uh, or about how God or how this, each of those books, I'm moving wires if you're wondering. They told me not to step on wires because I would break them and I would get in trouble. So that's what I'm doing. Um, how those books all work together to talk about the whole story of who God is. And we're going to start this morning in the book of Genesis so if you brought your Bible with you or you have it on your, on your phone or your iPad or whatever it is, go ahead and go to the book of Genesis, go to the book of Genesis chapter 12 will be the first thing that we're going to look at or the first scripture that we're going to look at this morning is Genesis chapter 12. And this morning I want to talk to you about this fact that God made promises. He's the God of promises. Now, when we look at the whole story of the Bible, I want to give you just a little outline of the Bible really quickly, okay? So the Bible is, we get the term Bible from the word Biblia. It's a, it's a Greek word, and it actually just means this. It means the books. It's all the books put together, okay? Make up the Bible. There are 66 books in the Bible that make up the entire Bible that we use today. There are 39 of those that are found in the Old Testament and 27 in the New. And those books tell the story of God. There are 44 different authors, and they wrote the Bible over 1,500 years, okay? So 44 different authors wrote each of these books over a span of 1,500 years. And here's the amazing thing about it is all of those authors tell the same story. That's pretty hard to do, even two authors writing in the same year, or the same month, or the same week, even talking about the same event. It's really difficult for authors to get that much right in a short period of time. So think of this, 44 different authors over 1,500 years tell the exact same story the exact same way, and there's a reason for that this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 tell us this about the Bible. It says that all Scripture is inspired by God, and it's profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So God tells us this, that all of Scripture was inspired by God Himself, and the Holy Spirit, who we were singing about this morning, He prompted man to write each of the books of the Bible, and He told him what it was that He wanted him to write, so that the story, the events of the Bible, all that we get from the Bible, stays in line and is true, and there's no errors found in it. So this morning, as we look at the book of Genesis, I, wanna, I want you to understand that the, Gen the book of Genesis is one book of five that all go together. The first five books of the Bible are really the first installments of the Torah, the Hebrew Bible. And those 
tell the beginning of who God is, the character of God. And they tell us all kinds of wonderful things about the person of God. And so this morning, I don't want to look at all of it. I want to look at one because I, I told my wife, the book of Genesis, we could be here till 5, 6 o'clock tonight if I, if I taught through the book of Genesis. And, and I know some of you might stay, but a lot of you in your car could just drive away and I'd be stuck. So, so we're just going to look at really one thought, one truth from the book of Genesis. We're going to talk about this, and God promised. When you start reading the book of Genesis... You could easily think that this is a story of mankind, right? I mean, you could read this book and all of the events that are found in the book of Genesis could kind of point us to man and who man is and what happened with mankind. But that's not really the story of the book of Genesis. I mean, it would be easy to grab that when we looked at the creation of the world and the creation of man and all living things, the fall of man, the history of man, the sin of man leading up to Noah and the great flood, the restoration of mankind and the world, the covenant with man that God makes, and and, and he puts a rainbow in the sky and tells man, look, I, I won't wipe mankind out the same way I did with Noah. He repopulates the world. Man accomplishes great things. The Tower of Babel happens, and and God again has to come down and separate man and spread them out. They scatter them. And then Abraham Abraham is chosen, and and Jacob and Isaac come along, and, and it could be looked at as the story of man. But all of those events point us back to God, back to who God is. Who, what God is all about, the love of God. And so this morning, I want to paint a picture for you of the promises of God and His goodness to mankind. Even in the middle of what we're facing right now, God is good to us. God cares for us. God shows us His mercy. And so this morning, I want to answer the question, what can we learn about the character of God? What can we see about the character of God by looking at the book of Genesis? And if we were to take a journey through the book of Genesis, we would quickly see some of these things about the character of God. And and just so you know, if if you kind of get the desire this morning after we talk about Genesis for a while that you want to read the book of Genesis, here's some, some truths about the character of God that you will see for the first time in the book of Genesis. He offers mankind belonging. He creates mankind and he says here, I want you to belong. I want you to be part of of a family. And he offers mankind fellowship. He, He walked in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve and he spent time with Adam and Eve and and they knew each other well. And then when Adam and Eve fell, when they sinned, he showed mercy. He showed his forgiveness. He introduced them to the concept of grace. He promised redemption. He extended his love to them. He offered them acceptance when they didn't deserve it. He blessed them in spite of their sin. He promised a home for them. He offered them a future. All of those truths of the character of God are found in the book of Genesis. And folks, let me tell you something. Every one of those truths he offers to you and to me today, the same way he did way back in the book of Genesis. And each of those truths give us a glimpse, a little teeny picture into the character of God. But this morning I want to talk to you about this, and God promised. In the very beginning when Adam and Eve fell in the garden and they sinned, God made a promise to make a way for the relationship between those that he created, you, me, Adam, Eve, those that he created, and the creator. He made a promise 
that that relationship could be restored. It could be made new. And clear back in Genesis chapter 2 and 3, God shows up to Adam and Eve after they sinned, and, and he said, look, I will make a way for, for someone to bridge the gap between you and me. And then when man's heart was completely wicked and had turned against God, and God couldn't stand the sight of evil any longer, he once again offers redemption and restoration through Noah and his family. And God shows up and says, look, man has turned completely against me. Their hearts are desperately wicked. But I made a prom promise to Adam and Eve way back in the garden, and I will keep my word. I will, I will keep my promise. And so he shows up to Noah, and he says, Noah, I'm going to put you on a boat, and I'm going to deal with the sin issue of the world, but I'm going to save you because I'm going to redeem all of mankind through you. And then we run into Genesis chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 12. Let me read verses 1 through 3 with you. And we see God actively pursuing His promise with mankind. And the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your land, your relatives, your father's house, to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be made a blessing. And I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. Listen to this. Catch this phrase. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Did you catch it? It was the promise of God. It was the same promise from Genesis to Adam and Eve. I'll redeem, I'll restore, I'll make a way. And he says to Abraham, look, I'm, I'm going to use you to bless all the nations of the world. Through you, I will make a way for man to be made right. And he continues that promise later in chapter 17. Verse 7, he says, It is a permanent covenant between your God and the God of your af offspring after you. Look. I made a promise and I will keep it. Just so you know, in Genesis chapter 17, when he says that to Abraham again, Abraham had just blew it completely. He had tried to fulfill God's promise on his own, his own way. He had tried to, to create an heir for his family by, by having a child with someone who wasn't his wife. And he blew it. And God shows up and he says, look, Abraham, I made a promise with you that I would look after saving the world, that I would redeem the world, and I will do it my way. You don't have to worry about it. Hey, does that sound like, like us ever? God offers us the promise of hope and mercy and grace and forgiveness. He offers us the promise that he will provide what we need each day. He offers the promise that He will strengthen us and encourage us. The Bible is full of promises where God says this, I will not leave you on your own. I'll be there for you. And we try to do it on our own. We try to make our own way. We're just like Abram. We're no different. We want to do things our way. And God says, no, I made a promise and I will fulfill my promise because I am the promise keeper. And he reminds Abram in this verse, I will see it through. I'll see it to the very end. You've never been to this point before, Abram, but I am God. And I will make a way for mankind to be made right. Now, if you know your history, fast forward into the Bible about 1,200 years, and you run into this guy by the name of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Let me tell you something about Isaiah. Isaiah was writing to the nation of Israel in the middle of political upheaval. It was really unstable. And the kings of Israel, while Isaiah was alive, kept rebelling against God. I know it's a common theme, but they would rebel against God and God would save them, and then they would rebel against God, and God would save them. And Isaiah 
writes them and, and, and he says, look, stop rebelling against God. God made a promise to redeem us, to save us. And we need to listen to God. And so 1,200 years after Abraham, remember, he promised to Adam and Eve. And a thousand years go by, he promised to Abraham. And 1,200 years later, we read these words from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 to 6. He says this, He was despised and rejected by man, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. Yet he himself, God, through Jesus Christ, bore our our sickness, our sin. And he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities, punishment of our peace was on him. And we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. 1,200 years later, Isaiah the prophet says exactly what God said. There is a Redeemer coming. There is a Redeemer who's going to come and He's going to save us from the very sin that separates us from fellowship with God. God used the prophet Isaiah to remind us of the promise that He made way back in Genesis chapter 2. Remember what I told Adam and Eve. Remember what I told Abraham. Remember what I promised through David that that a king would come through your line that would be the Redeemer. Remember, I keep my promise. Well, 700 years passed from the prophet Isaiah. Or about 700, we're not exactly sure. And all of a sudden we run into the Gospels And at the very beginning of Matthew, what do we run into? You tell me. I know, I can't hear you. So somebody said it. I heard you. Jesus was born, right? That's what you said, right? Jesus was born. We hit the Gospels, and all of a sudden, the Savior, the Messiah, shows up. He's born as a tiny baby. It's not the way we thought it would happen, folks. Nobody thought that the King, the Redeemer, the Messiah would come as a little baby. Nobody thought that. But it's how he showed up. Jesus, the Savior, the Redeemer, the Messiah, the one who would offer hope and love to all mankind shows up on the scene. Let me show you from John chapter 1 what Jesus has to say to us today about being the Messiah, and how he showed up to save us. John chapter 1 says it this way, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Hey folks, just so you know, God started it all. In the beginning was God, and the Word The Word is God. And God was the creator of it all. He started it all. He started mankind. He saw what would happen in mankind. He knew how He created mankind with a free will, with the freedom to make a choice. And man chose. And God made a promise in the middle of that choice that I'll make a way for redemption and forgiveness to happen. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He was with God in the beginning, and all things were created through Him. And apart from Him, not one thing was created that had been created. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. In other words, Jesus came, and as much as Satan tried to eradicate Jesus Christ, which he tried, 
He took him. He, he thought he had the greatest plan of all. I'll take him to a cross and I'll kill him. And once he's dead, it's over. I win. God goes, no, I had a plan. I knew that was going to happen. And I had a plan for mankind in the middle of that. And so verse 14 of that same chapter says this. And the word became flesh. And it dwelt among us. And we observed his glory. The glory as the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Folks, the promise that was made in Genesis chapter 2 and 3 to Adam and Eve, I'll make a way that deals with your sin. The promise that was restated throughout the book of Genesis to Noah, to Adam, I mean to Abram, to Jacob, to Isaac, to God's family as a whole, the promise that he made through David, there'll be a line that comes, the promise that the prophet Isaiah said, look, there is one who's coming, the promise has been kept. And it was kept in the person of Jesus Christ for you and for me. See, God, the character of God is this, folks. He's a God who keeps his promises. And he keeps his promises each and every day to every one of us. So how does knowing that God keeps his, prom his promises affect you and affect me today? Well, first, the promise of a Redeemer is still being fulfilled to this day. Jesus is still the answer to your and my sin problem, our sin sickness. Jesus Christ went to the cross and paid the price for my sin and for yours. And if we'll simply bow our knee and accept the fact that God paid the price for us on the cross and say yes to him and accept it, his forgiveness for our sin, he offers us a family. He offers us the ability to belong, to be accepted, to be for forgiven. It's still the same today. There is a Redeemer, and He is Jesus Christ. That promise is still the same. Second thing that I want you to catch this morning about knowing that God is the promise keeper is this. He has promised not only to be our Redeemer, which is huge, by the way, but He's promised to always be with us. Hebrews 13, 5 the end of that verse puts it this way, Be satisfied with what you have, for he himself said, I will never leave you nor abandon you. Folks, I grab that every day. I don't know about you, but we're living in some kind of uncertain times. We're unsure how this will all play out. Oh yes, this is a virus and it will move on, but we're unsure how the, the, our economy will be affected because of the shutdown. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what our job might look like or not look like. We don't know how it could affect families. We, we don't know where it could go long term. We have no idea. But every day of my life I get up and I, and I know this. God, the creator, is still in control. And God gave me a promise. And I grab that promise every day and that promise is this. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will always be with you. And so every day of my life when I get up and I roll out of bed and I work the crinks out of my back and I, I start to get on for the day, I say, God, thank you for being my redeemer. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me a family and a home. And thank you that you will give me the strength that I need for today. It's your promise. Thank you that I know that whatever I face today, you'll be with me. And you'll walk with me, you'll guide me, you'll carry me, and you'll strengthen me through whatever it is that I face today. Hey, that promise is yours too. If you have a relationship with God, 
His promise is to never leave you or forsake you. His promise is to be with you, to grant you the courage and the strength that you need to face this week. The promise is yours. Hey, if you don't have a relationship with God this morning, the promise is yours. He offers you a redeemer. He offers you forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And you can have that this morning. You can have hope and a future by knowing God today. Would you bow with me this morning? Father, thank you so much. Thank you for the encouragement that there is in your word. Thank you that you are a God who keeps your promises. Thank you that we can walk all the way through Scripture and see the promise of a Redeemer unfold before our very eyes. Thank you that we can experience the forgiveness of that Redeemer, Jesus Christ, today. Thank you that you offer us hope and a future as children of yours. Thank you for the promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us, but you'll be an encouragement to strengthen us and lead us through each day. God, grant us an ability to trust that promise as we leave this place. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Would you just uh, hang out with us for the next couple of minutes as we have one more song of worship together?